Welcome to a video tutorial of Ernest Hemingway's uh, life in Idaho, specifically Sun Valley, um, a place that he loved to visit, especially in the fall during hurricane season. Um, and this video will outline how Ernest Hemingway came to be in Sun Valley, um, connected with the Sun Valley Resort in its very early years, and um, some of Hemingway's experiences here in Sun Valley, uh, hunting, finishing For Whom the Bell Tolls in Suite 206 of the Sun Valley Lodge, um, the people he befriended, the local hunting guides, people he spent time with, and some of the tragic, um, well really three tragic moments that happened um, while Hemingway was in Sun Valley, um, and how those Two of the moments were hunting moments, and uh, one was obviously Ernest Hemingway's tragic end of his life here in July 2nd, 1961. Um, uh, just trying to provide a context for how these moments uh, hunting and uh, also um, the suicide um, can be reconciled uh, with the Hemingway code here. So um, the goal, as you could read, from the website is for you to go out and visit the major sites related to Hemingway's life in Sun Valley, specifically Suite 206 and Sun Valley Lodge. If you're facing a lodge, facing away from the ice rink, it is the balcony, first balcony on your far left. That's where um, some of the narrative moments that I'm going to describe in this video occurred, and that's where he wrote For Whom the Bell Tolls. On the Trail Creek Memorial, if you go out um, Sun Valley Road, uh, past the Sun Valley, uh, what do you call that, uh, golf course <laughs> and Nordic Center, and you go to the, the memorial, you'll see his bust um, and the uh, part of the eulogy that, that Hemingway wrote for Gene Van Gilder. Hemingway's house out Warm Springs. Uh, it'd be best if we get you in there and, and have a tour, but I'd love for you just to see um, how he, his house there and how he shot clays off his back deck. And then uh, a must-see uh, is the Hemingway grave in the Ketchum Cemetery and who's buried near him um, and his children and his, and his grandchildren um, all around him. So lots of stuff to check out here locally. It will enhance your understanding of Hemingway's life. Um, you can either visit them before you watch this video or after. Either way, I think it's important to, to have a, a tangible context um, to his life here. And this is, you know, a famous image of Hemingway, uh, the Idaho mountains in the background, typing uh, away for him the ball. Tolls an odd image because Hemingway wrote everything standing up. Um, he liked to be um, active and moving, as you, as you know, as a soldier and as a hunter and fisherman. Um, but this image, uh, you know, which was used by Sun Valley Resort to... Um, to put Sun Valley on the map as a place for icons, literary icons, um, and uh, Hollywood magnets like Clark Gable and Gary Cooper, Marilyn Monroe. Um, and so really this image is important because this is, it captures why Hemingway was um, connected to Sun Valley um, to begin with, uh, Gene Van Gilder, uh, who was the Sun Valley publicist in 1936, contacted him maybe many times, who spent a lot of time in Red Lodge, Montana, um, and other places in Montana, and, the, and, and interestingly, he wrote about Montana, um, and he wrote about Wyoming, but he never wrote about Sun Valley, Idaho. I think it was a place that he wanted to keep for his own, um, and it never made into any of short stories, um, Yet he wrote his major part of For Whom the Bell Tolls here and did some of his best writing in his career here. So it was a place he deeply loved. And I'm just projecting here, but I imagine he wanted to keep it to himself and, and, and not put it into any of his writings. Um, so he was here from September 20th, 1939. Um, and ultimately, his last moment here was July 2nd, 1961. That's a little misleading. He wasn't here for all of that time. Um, he uh, you know, spent a, a good chunk of time here, but often in the fall, um, and came back later um, 
in the 50s with his fourth wife, Mary Hemingway. So here's some, some background. Sunville Life Resort opened September 21st, 1936. You all know the history. Avon Harriman, um, this destination resort. There were only 100 people in Ketchum at the time. So this was a remote, rural place. Um, and they needed to have some publicity to get people to get on the train from L.A., um, Chicago, other places to come to this destination um, resort, not just in the winter for skiing, but obviously for the summer as well. So you'll see a lot of summer images of Hemingway here in Sun Valley. As I said, he lived in Sweet, lived in Sweet 206, and part of the deal was if he, they could use his images to help publicize Sun Valley to the world, uh, he could stay at the Sun Valley Lodge and um, have free room and board, and along with his family. And he loved that idea. Um, he was coming off of uh, a failed relationship with his second wife, Piper, Pauline, who was very wealthy and had a house in Key West. Um, and he was uh, had fallen in love with Martha Gellhorn and her desire to cover the Spanish Civil War. She was a war correspondent. And uh, he brought her here um, to Sun Valley. Uh, and so his early years here in Sun Valley were with Martha and then off to, um, to, uh, other, other places, <clears throat> Key West and Cuba, and finally returns with his fourth wife, um, he married Martha Gellhorn, his third wife, and then returns to Sun Valley and spends his final years here with Mary Hemingway. So Gene Van Gilder was a Sun Valley publicist and asked Ernest for publicity photos in exchange for room and board, again came with Martha Gellhorn. Um, he was in separation with, with Pauline, had no money. And I think that's an important part of understanding Hemingway's experiences here in Ketchum in Sun Valley. He came, um, obviously he, he had written many successful novels and had done well, but he wasn't one to uh, save his money. You know, he had In Our Time, Sun Also Rises, Farewell to Arms, written many short stories, published... Um, but uh, was still supported by the wealthy wives that he that he uh, married. And but he came to Sun Valley. You could argue, you know, sort of flat broke coming out of this separation and eventual divorce with Pauline. And he needed to write a good book. Um, and he had twelve chapters in hand um, for for whom the bell tolls. And so. Part of the goal here in this video is to show you how his life here in Sun Valley connects with the unspoken code that he lived and developed in his texts. And so complete task well comes to mind, right? Just to remind you, um, complete task well means to maintain discipline and honor in the means by which you complete tasks, all tasks in life, and to strive for noble ends, even if the ends are unattainable, in order to strengthen the self. And so how did he do that here in Sun Valley? He woke at 5 a.m. every morning and wrote until noon. Remember, he's writing standing up. He would have lunch at the lodge, and then he would go down to hunt on Silver Creek with Bud Purdy or Lloyd Arnold, or he would go hunt pheasants in Shoshone, um, and he was happiest doing those two things. Remember, completing tasks well strengthens the self, so writing was primarily the task that Hemingway um, pursued. Obviously, it was his great talent, um, but hunting as well was something that he greatly valued and doing it well. And so to combine the two during the day, to be able to write well for you know, from 5 a.m. till lunchtime, and then to be able to have, have a nice lunch at the lodge and then go down to Silver Creek and Shoshone and hunt pheasants and ducks was, for Ernest Hemingway, as you can imagine, um, the perfect day, and he would have a groundhog day every day. He would just wake up and do it again. Um, and I think it gave him space and time to think, um, to be outdoors um, in this wonderful fall weather. And, uh, and the great hunting um, encouraged him and made him in good spirits. And so he would wake up every morning, I like to think, uh, at 5 a.m. And he would read everything he'd written that, uh, the day before. And he would start, as he said, that's how you do it. And he would start writing um, 5.30, 5.45, all the way to lunch. At one point, um, he had lunch with a great hunting guide, Bud Purdy, who just recently passed away, um, who has a house down on Silver Creek, and he, um, they were having a lunch in Ketchum, I forget where, I think at the Alpine, and he ran, ran out and got a bottle of wine because the restaurant didn't serve wine. He brought it back, and he said, we got to celebrate because I just wrote a thousand words, and I think 
I think I'll get a dollar for every word. So he knew it was going well here. He knew he was on to something with For Whom the Bell Tolls, and he was right. Um, in my mind, I think For Whom the Bell Tolls is the, is the best text to read if you really want to understand um, the Hemingway Code and Robert Jordan as the heroic uh, character who's able to live by all the principles of the code. Um, and so he worked hard, he completed tasks well, he published the book in 1940, um, and after Marty... Gellhorn and Ernest had covered the Spanish Civil War together. I uh, sold 491,000 copies in the first six months. And then, you know, here's the point here. Uh, he was able to finish it all the way through and sell the rights to um, Paramount Pictures for $100,000, a lot of money at that time. So he was getting um, proceeds from his book sales and from the... Um, and from the... Uh, selling the rights to Paramount Pictures, even though it's not a great film and he didn't like any of the films that were made of his works. In fact, he hated all the films that were made of his works. But nonetheless, um, he achieved his goal. He needed to write a good book, and he published it, and, and, he, and he sold it to, to Paramount and did very well financially as a result. Okay, some other code principles that, that emerge here in his experiences um, while uh, while writing and hunting in Sun Valley. So the two that come to mind are valuing solidarity, right? Remember to develop and maintain faith in the others who embody and exhibit the other principles of the code. This happens in many of the characters throughout the text we've read, right? That uh, Jake Barnes was disgusted by the people he was surrounded by, Brett and Mike Campbell and Robert Cohn, but he loved being with Montoyo, the hotel owner, who was an aficionado of bullfighting. He loved being with Pedro Romero, and admiring Pedro Romero. Um, and again, uh, just briefly, uh, Robert Jordan um, found a coded mentor figure in Pilar, who was committed to the Republican cause, and in Anselmo, um, who was, even though he hated the killing in war, knew it was necessary because he was deeply committed to a cause. Um, and so here is local hunting guides, Bud Purdy, as I mentioned, on Silver Creek, and Lloyd Arnold, who wrote a book about... Um, High, it's called High on the Wild, Hemingway's Life in Sun Valley, um, which is no longer in print. He surrounded himself with, with these local hunting guides and loved how well they hunted, how well they knew the land, how they could put uh, Ernest onto some ducks and some pheasants. And so he developed experiential knowledge um, about the hunting here from these local experts. Right? Remember, experiential knowledge means being skeptical of any knowledge divorced from experience and admiring those who are experts from experience. And so he went jump shooting on the Little Wood River um, over by Cary um, with Bud Purdy, flushed three ducks, and bang, 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 Bud Purdy said um, he got all three ducks with three shots. You have three shells in your shotgun. And Birdie, uh, Purdy's comment was that, is that Hemingway wouldn't have been happier had you handed him a million dollars. And so, you know, here I like to think that Hemingway really um, had his happiest moments in his life here. He was deeply in love with Martha Gellhorn, Marty Gellhorn, who was an amazing woman war correspondent. Um, he was writing what came to be one of his greatest texts, one he uh, admired deeply along with the old man in the sea. Um, and here he is having some great hunting and able to do the two things that he loved the most really well um, with people who he admired, who had experiential knowledge. Um, great image here of Ernest Hemingway hunting. Uh, this is with Mary Hemingway uh, over here. Here's Ernest. Um, with uh, lots of ducks down on Silver Creek. Speaking through actions is another uh, code principle that, uh, that Hemingway um, really exhibited in, in, in his experiences here in Sun Valley. Remember that speaking through actions means do not be windy or messy and flamboyant in your speech to convey the code. Don't talk about the things that you do well. Um, you are what you do, not what you say you do. Um, so he went out hunting on Silver Creek with John and Anna Berenger and the black lab, a black lab named Bullet, a lab that Ernest loved deeply. He loved having dogs around. Um, John, did not, John Berenger did not place safety on his gun, and he went to go pick up his gun and pulled the trigger accidentally and shot Bullet in the leg. Tragically, uh, Bullet dies... I don't know if this is Bullet or not, but there is um, Hemingway hunting down in the Silver Creek area. Um, 
And Ernest was furious that, that, that this happened, right? The unspoken code in hunting um, is that you always put your gun on safety. So you do pull it up and you accidentally hit the trigger, it doesn't go off. Well, he rides in a separate car back to Sun Valley Resort, and he goes up to clean his guns in Suite 206 on the balcony, and Martha Gellhorn's having a drink on the back patio, right looking out at the where the ice rink is now, and Ernest sees two ducks flying by. Remember, there are very few people in Ketchum at this time, 100, 100 people in Ketchum, so it doesn't look like the way it does today. So Ernest has his guns, right? He's, he's cleaning his guns. He sees two ducks go by. He's able to load them, load his guns, and he sees that one duck has a has a wounded leg and is going to die a miserable death. And so he shoots, bang, bang, he shoots um, the wounded duck and its mate. Um, and I imagine, I don't know the end of the story, he's able to collect them and eat, clean them and eat them. Um, but when, when Martha hears the, the shots go off, she screams, she thinks to herself, oh no, Ernest has shot John Berenger because he was so furious that Berenger had broken the code of um, uh, of ethical hunting, um, so I like to think like like Pedro Romero, who wipes away the losing the fist fight with Robert Cohn in The Sun Also Rises. Um, you know how Pedro wipes away by by being a great bullfighter, by um, wearing down the bull well, all for himself, not for the crowd. I like to think that Hemingway here wipes away being witness the unethical behavior of John Berenger by killing the wounded duck and his mate. He conveyed the unwritten hunting code by his actions um, for himself, if you will, um, um, as, a, as opposed to accosting John Berenger for not having his safety. Um, I also think that the code principle here, valuing nature, has a lot to do with um, his experiences here in Sun Valley. Remember, valuing nature means do not deify nature as the romantics would. Don't worship it, but delve in appreciation for nature's beauty intricacy and wholeness that's therapeutic to the observer, right? But also, I think that's important, and Hemingway does write about that, but I, but nature often is an arena upon which to project one's ethical code, whether you're fishing and wetting your hand before you touch the trout, or whether you're putting the safety on your gun. Um, it's an arena, it's a place, it's a context in which you can actually project an order onto the world um, that shows you live by an unspoken, unwritten uh, code. There's Ernest and Martha. Um, he's showing her how to hunt. Martha wanted nothing to do with hunting here in Sun Valley. <laughs> she was going along with it uh, uh, but because Ernest was so passionate about it. Um, a second experience um, is connected to the Memorial on Trail Creek, and I hope you've been out there, or will go out there, and there it is. Um, there's Hemingway's bust looking out at uh, Silver Creek, looking out at Trail Creek here that flows through community school, right? Um, and his, he's facing out at the hills, and I love this image because it has the, um, the cottonwoods and the aspen trees in full bloom, and he loved the fall, right? And the best of all he loved the fall is the, is the inscription right here below it. It's actually a eulogy for Gene Van Gilder. Um So this was dedicated in 1966, um, five years after they laid Ernest Hemingway to rest in the cemetery. Um, and it's an important story. Um, why uh, it's an important story as to uh, who died and Ernest's eulogy for Jean Van Gilder, um, a great way to uh, Sun Valley. And so the, the rubric here, or the principle here that, that, that is related to this narrative moment is completing tasks well. So on October 28th, 1939, uh, one month after his first you know, his first time in Sun Valley. Here he is one month. He's 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 befriended Gene Van Gilder, admires Gene Van Gilder, who likes to hunt, um, and uh, is a man of action, and uh, Hemingway loved spending time with him and drinking with him. Um, so it's Gene Van Gilder and Lloyd Arnold and this man named Benner went down on the Snake River, another great hunting spot. And they're in a canoe, and Van Gilder stood up in the bow when the, these mallards flew by, to, and put his gun up to his shoulder. And Benner, who was in the rear of the canoe, um, grabbed his gun as well and broke the unwritten code. And that is, you could argue, you shouldn't shoot from a canoe. Um, although it is allowed, it's, sort of an, it's a risky thing to do. And certainly shooting over the shoulder of another is a very risky thing to do. Well, 
uh, Benner shoots and actually accidentally shoots right through Gene Van Gilder, and tragically they take him to... Well, Hemingway's not on this trip, but he's back in Sun Valley Resort writing, um, but certainly he hears about it that same day. Um, Gene Van Gilder dies 30 minutes on the banks, 30 minutes later, 30 banks, 30 minutes after um, being shot. He was only 34 years old. So in the eulogy, they had the family, the Van Gilder family asked Ernest to write the eulogy, and, he, he, and it's a beautiful eulogy, and you hope you read it all. Um, but in it, he uh, he was very uh, hesitant to write the eulogy because he didn't know uh, Gene Van Gilder as well as other people, but they wanted Ernest to write one. And so um, it's a beautiful eulogy, and he wrote this at the end. He said, you know, best of all, Gene loved the fall. The yellow leaves and the trout streams, he will be part of them forever. So sort of a Wordsworthian and transcendent, right? So he will now, now is a part of the earth, um, but, he doesn't, but it doesn't use the language that Wordsworth would have used. Um, it's just this idea that now Gene Van Gilder is a part of the earth that he um, so deeply loved and this place that he so deeply loved. And these words written by Hemingway to moralize Gene Van Gilder, they can easily be applied to Ernest and his love for Idaho, rivers, streams, wilderness, um, and wildlife. And there it is right there. Best of all, he loved the fall, the leaves yellow on the cottonwoods, the leaves floating on the trout streams, and above the hills, the high blue windless skies. Now he'll be a part of them forever. Um, so I think it's important to remember this is not uh, something um, written about Ernest Hemingway. This is not something that people misperceive that, um, that this could be a eulogy written about Ernest Hemingway at his funeral in 1961. It wasn't. It was a eulogy that Hemingway wrote in 1939 for the man who he, who he deeply admired and for the man who actually is the sole reason why Hemingway is connected to Sun Valley at all. But again... Failure to complete tasks well, failure to live by an unspoken, unwritten ethical code of hunting, um, failure to sp it sp speak through actions well. Um, this deep, this obviously um, had a much more powerful emotional effect on Hemingway than the loss of Bullet. But two interesting narrative moments that I think um, led Hemingway to spend more time with people like Bud Purdy and Lloyd Arnold in hunting, those who really knew how to, how to hunt well. Um, and, and not cause unnecessary. And I think it's important to think about how this connects to some of the narrative moments in Hemingway, right? So as in Big Two-Hearted River, you know, as you wrote, unless they are of your party, uh, fishing rivers with others can ruin the experience. Well, why was that? And he was referring in that story to the dead trout that he found uh, on the banks and, and washed up on rocks. And he picked them up, and he knew that the fishermen... And this was Nick Adams in the Big Tuart River at the end of Inner Time, knew that the fishermen did not wet their hands and ruin the protective layer on the trout. Um, and in this instance, the failure to follow the unwritten ethical code of fishing um, led to the, to the death of the trout. Well, the failure to follow the unwritten ethical code of hunting tragically led to Gene Van Gilder's untimely and tragic death. Um, and here he is spending more time with Bud Purdy and Lloyd Arnold um, those who know and those who live by experiential knowledge. Well, a um, little pause here before we, we get to um, the cemetery and uh, Ernest Hemingway's last days on this planet in Ketchum, Idaho. Uh, he had four wives. I think it's important just to review um, the four wives here, and how his time with Martha Gellhorn, Marty Gellhorn, really exhibits this this code, being faithful to and in love, taking risks in love as an antidote to despair, and maintaining fidelity in love. Um, yes, he had four wives. Yes, he was coming of a separation of Pauline, but he uh, was deeply in love with uh, Marty Gellhorn and admired her, her uh, can-do attitude, or her, her optimism, her willingness to go to dangerous places and cover cover wars. In fact, he went to China uh, with Marty Gellhorn to cover that uh, a war there. He went to the Spanish Civil War, obviously, that led to his um, great novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls. Let's review some of the some of the, the wives here. So Hadley looks exactly like um, the nurse that Hemingway had uh, in World War One that we like to think of as Catherine Barkley in A Farewell to Arms. Agnes Van Kwansky is the actual nurse um, who Hemingway did not marry, who actually was dumped, she dumped him. <laughs> we get that 
uh, short, we get that uh, a very short story in, in our time that talks about that. Um, but Hadley was eight years older than uh, Ernest and had a, had a family trust that allowed them to move to Paris and they conceived the child, Jack Hemingway, who lived his whole life here in, in Sun Valley and was integral in protecting um, Sun Valley, Silver Creek Preserve and worked with the Nature Conservancy. He was a great fly fisherman. So there they are, uh, Ernest and Hadley in there. And I think that ultimately this was the woman he loved um, deeply um, and was very committed to her. Um, even though it didn't work out, and he moved on as thing as the relationship deteriorated, and here he is with Piper Pauline, um, who also had a lot of money and in a house in Key West, and he fathered um, two boys with her, Patrick and Gregory, um, and she was four years older than Ernest Hemingway, and as you can see here, he is with a marlin or sailfish, um, and Pauline, and this is the relationship that deteriorated before um, coming. To here he is with Martha Gellhorn, uh, married her from 1939 to 1946. She was nine years younger. Interestingly, both his third and fourth wives were younger. Um, and we know about Martha, right? World War II and Spanish Civil War correspondent. She had money and helped buy the Finca house in Cuba, and they lived in Cuba. They never lived in Sun Valley together other than visiting um, Carte Blanche with the Sun Valley Resort. Um, and she was uh, a very feisty, independent um, woman who uh, really sort of a male counterpart to Hemingway's gusto and ma machismo. Um, she embodied all of those elements as a war correspondent um, who uh, was very successful in her career. Uh, it didn't last long. It was sort of a fireball of romance, seven years. Um, and again, look at this. So in 1946, boom, Mary. He falls in love with Mary. Um, and it's his longest marriage, right, up until his death, so, um, 15 years he was married to her. She was deeply in love with Ernest, admired him, um, was sort of a mother figure to him. You can see, I love this image, because they just look so happy, um, here in the background, the boulders, boulder white clouds here, um, and, uh, you know, they met in London, um, he bought the house out of Warm Springs with her, and um, had many happy years with her before his tragic um, downturn toward depression um, and despair, and we'll talk about that next. I well, first actually the Hemingway house. There's his house out of Warm Springs, um, and this is the deck where he would shoot uh, clay pigeons off of. Um, this is also the house um, that where he took his own life with a shotgun. It's, you can notice that it's wood paneled and if you get inside it's actually modeled after the Sun Valley Lodge um, and we'll talk about that in a second as to why it looks exactly like the Sun Valley Lodge inside. It was purchased in 1859 by Chuck Atkinson of Atkinson's Markets. Um, <clears throat> A, uh, a, a person that uh, Hemingway hunted with down at Silver Creek, uh, and they owned the was now a Silver Creek store down there. That's where Atkinson's Market started out. Um, but Chuck bought it uh, with his, just, just to drive down the price so that they wouldn't uh, take advantage of, of the Hemingway name. Um, it was the only house uh, Ernest ever owned in the United States. Remember, he lived in Key West with Pauline, which was her house. He lived in Cuba, in the Finca. Um, which Martha Gellhorn helped buy. Um, and he lived abroad in Paris with Hadley, uh, but this was the only place he uh, actually, uh, per only house he actually purchased under um, and owned um, in the United States. Well, Fidel Castro, an individual uh, who Hemingway knew, took over Cuba in 1960, 1961. Hemingway was escaping that revolution and the fall hurricane season would spend many um, uh, seasons uh, fall seasons escaping the hurricanes in the 50s leading up to his final years here in Sun Valley. Bob and Dan Topping were the builders and they owned um, the New York Yankees. Um, Bob Topping was asked to leave Sun Valley Lodge due to heavy drinking um, and he built the, so he built the lodge to look to build his house to look exactly like the lodge. Um, and Bob lived in it for years and sold it to 
to Hemingway via Chuck Atkinson in 1959. Uh, Hemingway's doctor here uh, from 1959 to 1961 was George Saviors, uh, and he wrote that Hemingway Ernest was broke when he was here, had to produce a good book, kept his drinking in check, and was friendly and anime with those who guided and loved the hunting in the area. And it's an important uh, piece. Well, this is also a site, the house is a site of great tragedy. Um, this is where he, Hemingway took his life. Um, and I want to provide some context as to um, what led this man who lived by an unwritten code of ethical behavior, right? Self-imposed code of how to conduct oneself. Well, how could he commit suicide? And this is not to justify suicide or his suicide by any stretch of the imagination, but it's to give a context as to what led him to this to that uh, tragic end of his life. Um, he suffered from many concussions. He suffered from what we would call bipolar depression at this time. And the, uh, and the treatment for that at the Mayo Clinic um, was to give him electroshock shock treatments to shock him out of the depression, which actually led to um, more memory loss. So the concussions led to memory loss. The depression led to memory loss. Electroshock treatments led to memory loss. Um, in April of 1961, on Hemingway's first attempt at suicide were... Mary came downstairs and found uh, Ernest with a shotgun in his mouth. Um, on that day, he learned that JFK had announced the U.S. invasion of Cuba, so he believed he was never going to be able to return to the Finca's house in Cuba, where he wrote and actually finished for him the Batols and wrote The Old Man in the Sea, a place where he deeply loved and couldn't imagine not being able to return to. He was also very paranoid, um, sort of a part of his depression, about the federal government investing him for tax fraud, and there's this really strange story where they're driving through the streets to catch him, and they, and he points out to um, his doctor George Saviors, there's people up there in that bank, and they're going over my tax returns, and the feds are after me, and it just it just showed that Hemingway was not of sound mind, and, and catch him. Now here's this great paper, you know, here's Hemingway on this. Um, <clears throat> hunting safari and their plane goes down they had multiple plane crashes and this one um it took a while for them to to get to uh mary and ernest hemingway um and so the paper says you know hemingway wife killed in an air crash um a little premature headline because they weren't obviously but there were many concussions from his boxing. Uh, there was a car accident in London during World War II um, where Hemingway had a concussion from hitting the windshield. There were two plane crashes in Africa on safaris, 1951-1952. The second one, the cockpit was in smoke and Ernest Hemingway headbutted his way out of the door in order to save his life and Mary's life. Another concussion which led to an inability to write well because of his loss of memory. Um, and so the two books he was working on while he was here were Movable Feast and Island Stream, both unfinished, both books that he felt that his memory was preventing him from doing what he does best, which is writing. Um, well, some code principles here that I think are a part of um, Hemingway's final moments here. Embracing the present and self-assessing, right? You are what you do now is, is the embrace the present definition, not what you have done or will do. In the face of adversity, hold on to your stoic and enduring faith in yourself without despair. Um, and self-assessing, don't overvalue the praise or condemnation given to you by literary critics or by peers. Do things for yourself and value your self-awareness of a clean line with maximum ex of exposure. And so, you know, while both of these code principles uh, could be read as being violated by the suicide, they also, I think, paradoxically can be read as contributing to the suicide. He lived in the moment. He knew he was what he is now. Um, and what he is now is one who can't remember, who suffers from great depression, who can't write. Um, even though he continued to hunt, it still wasn't the same for him. Um, and I think of that in the contrast, I think of him in his Hemingway at Warm Springs House in contrast to his time in Suite 206 where he was writing from 5 a.m. till lunch beautifully, um, passionately, um, and celebrating that he's going to get a dollar for every word, and he wrote a thousand words that day with this. He couldn't finish these texts. He would go hunting, but would not, with, not with the same sort of passion that he did when he was here um, in the late 30s. Um, and so, so he was self-assessing and realizing that, you know, I am not the man I used to be, I'm not the writer I used to be, I'm not the hunter I used to be, and the things that define me that make me up, make up who I am, I'm in, any, unable to do well. Here he is um, with a shotgun, um, 
Don't know if that is the shotgun that Hemingway used to end his life, but that is an older Hemingway, um, heavier set, um, not looking very cheery there. And on July 2nd, 1961, three months after his first suicide attempt in, 19, in 1961, on the day of the news of the U.S. invasion of Cuba, and two days before his birthday, July 2nd, um, Ernest placed his back against the wall of his living room in the Warm Springs house, pointed the shotgun at his head, and placed his big toe on the trigger. Mary found Ernest that morning. Uh, it was a gory, gory scene, and called Chuck Atkinson, who came over and cleaned up everything and buried the shotgun on the plot of land that is now a Conoclast book. So he actually cut up the shotgun and buried it there. Um, interestingly, we believe that's where the shotgun is. Um, on Sun Valley Road. Well, how do you find the code? Um, there's some really interesting chapter in For Whom the Bell Tolls where Hemingway writes disparagingly about Robert Jordan's father's suicide, how it was a sign of his of weakness and cowardice, and how he admired Robert Jordan admired his grandfather and his and his valor in civil in the Civil War, and that was his coded mentor as opposed to his father. And interestingly, Ernest's own father took his own life, um, and Ernest had a strained relationship with his father um, throughout his entire life, often over the, the writings um, that his father disapproved of. Um, so how could a man who developed the principles of a heroic code that includes avoiding self-pity, probably number one here, related to suicide, completing tasks well, speaking through actions, what's he saying by this suicide, and being faithful to and in love, right? Remember Mary... Deeply in love with him, he's deeply in love with Mary. His happy, you could argue one of his happiest marriages. How could he take his own life and violate all those code principles, especially um, pitying himself so much that he wants to end his life and violating his love with Mary? So it's important to understand the context of the tragic end of his life and how important it was for Ernest Hemingway to complete tasks well, self-assess, and speak through actions. All of his heroic characters exhibit the principles of the code, not by expressing them and cataloging them, but by living them in action. Remember, Robert Jordan holding off the fascist soldiers while the others escape. Pedro Romero performing brilliantly as a matador without ever looking up into the crowd to strengthen himself after being beaten up by Cone. Jake Barnes finally breaking it off with Brett. Nick Adams fly fishing well and pouring himself into the process of camping um, and doing things well in Big Tarted River after World War One, And then Frederick Henry loving Catherine Barkley with great passion. These are all characters who exhibit the principles of the code by how they conduct themselves. Um, so how could he, who created these characters and this unspoken code, um, end his life? Well, not justification, but a context. If writing was his work, and it was a task that defined him and allowed him to assess his self-worth, and bipolar depression, multiple concussions, the electroshock treatment, prevented his memory from working well enough to write well. Um, this led Hemingway to a place where he was no longer in control of his actions. Um, there are so many stories that I want to write, but cannot Hemingway mention to Dr. Savior in the final and catch him. And believing he was unable to return to his house in Cuba, his favorite place to write, and suffering deeply from depression that was compounded by um, his inability to write and his lack of passion for hunting, um, his, his inability to live up to his own self-imposed code, I would argue Ernest lost control of his ability to follow the code principle of avoiding self-pity. He lost control over his actions and the notion that we all live lives as struggles against self-destruction and in a moment, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an action that really belies the rest of the principles of the code, he ended his life on a second attempt, July 2nd, 1961, tragically, horribly, much to the despair of the country and the admirers of his writing. And there's his gravestone, um, July 21st, 1899, July 2nd, 1961. So maybe it was, I might be wrong here, maybe it was, he took his life um, not two days before his birthday, but 19 days before his birthday. I stand correct. There's the gravesite, often with whiskey bottles, and the pennies and the coins I am unaware of as to why those are there.
But here he is with Mary. Um, arguably his happiest marriage here, um, who deeply missed her husband after he took his life. Um, but if you visit the, the cemetery, and this is her last um, place I hope you visit, um, you'll see that he's buried right next to Mary, her gravestone, 1908 to 1986. Um, lived out her years here. And he's buried next to Jack Hemingway, his first son, right, with Hadley, the fly fisherman, fought in World War II. <coughs> the famous story about him is diving, jumping out of an airplane as a paratrooper in World War II with a f fly rod in his backpack, and, um, and he would fish some of the streams um, in the remote country um, uh, of, of, of Western Europe. Uh, and again, preserved Silver Creek. His daughter is Muriel Hemingway. Um, Margo, his other daughter, committed suicide after in a drug overdose. Um, tragic uh, uh, mental illness in the Hemingway family. Um, and he, uh, Jack Hemingway, is buried next to his wife, Louise Puck Hemingway. And uh, Gregory Hemingway, uh, Hemingway's other son with Pauline, was an ER doctor in Montana who actually had a sex change and became Gloria and uh, ran nude down a median strip in Florida and was arrested and then died in a woman's correctional facility in Florida. So again, more mental illness in the Hemingway family, right? You have a drug overdose, Jack's daughter, Hemingway's granddaughter, um, and then uh, Jack uh, Hemingway's son um, yeah, being you know, losing touch with reality and running down... Uh, or a median strip in Florida and being arrested, and then I think suicide, it's unclear, um, in a women's correctional facility in Florida. He's also, I think this is really important, buried next to these individuals, and this is really the powerful part of um, going to the ceremony, going to the cemetery, and seeing that he's buried next to Tilly and Lloyd Arnold. Tilly wrote a book called Hemingway in Idaho, no longer in, no longer in in print, and Lloyd Arnold wrote a book on Hemingway called Hemingway High on the Wild. Um, the Hunting Guide, friends, um, loved them dearly. Again, not, you know, spending his time, even though there's so many pictures of Gary Cooper and uh, Clark Gable and Hemingway, um, he really spent time with the Arnolds. And Chuck and Floss Atkinson are his friends. He's buried next to them. Gene Van Gilder is buried uh, next to Hemingway. Um, or Hemingway actually joined um, the gravesite because obviously Van Gilder preceded Hemingway's death. Taylor Williams, another great hunting guide from Shoshone, they hunt pheasant together, um, who came out to Kentucky, as a, from Kentucky to catch him. Um, he spent lots of time with Taylor Williams, Lloyd Arnold, Chuck Atkinson, Van Gilder hunting, um, Taylor Williams, then his doctor, who he loved dearly, Dr. George Savior, is there as well. Um, these are the common people, I would, you know, I don't call them peasants, <laughs> but there is um, a sense of, you know, peasant wisdom that we got in um, Farewell to Arms. There's a belief that people who, or if you will, are defeated from the beginning, or, or um, destroyed from the beginning, um, who all they have is to take pride in their work, um, people like... Um, Bud Purdy, I don't know, he just died this year, so I don't know if Bud's going to be buried um, in the Ketchum Cemetery, or has been buried in the Ketchum Cemetery near the Hemingways, I have to go check that out. But there's this belief that, you know, he wanted to be with the common people who knew the land well, who lived by an unspoken code, and he took great value in that. And I think that's one of the great takeaways of Hemingway's time here um, in Sun Valley. So I hope you enjoyed uh, this review of Hemingway's uh, life in Sun Valley and uh, how it connects to the code principles and, uh, you know, being able to understand the tragic end to Hemingway's life in the context um, of his final moments of despair here. Um, I think he had his, some of his greatest moments in his life and some of his greatest writing occurred here in Sun Valley and some of his saddest and most tragic moments happened here in Ketchum, an important place um, for Ernest Hemingway.